Welcome back to Division One Rejects. I'm your host, Kobe Manzo. Back at it tonight with episode 100 and, man, 70-something. They all blur together, but we're back. That's the important part. I got a great guest joining me tonight, the uh, outside linebackers coach and recruiting coordinator at the oldest private military institution in the United States of America, that being Norwich University. It's PJR Curie. He is uh, joining me here shortly. I'm excited to talk to him. Just a really interesting setup uh, that they have going on over there. And the more I learn about it, the more intrigued I am. It's something that I have not seen or heard the likes of in college football, uh, just in the way they handle being a quote unquote service academy and how they approach that, I think is just really neat in general. So definitely stay tuned for that one. They have a World War II tank at their stadium. That, in its own right, very cool piece of news. But otherwise, from me tonight, we've got some uh, scheduling news and some other kind of rule changes from the RMAC, the D2 conference out west there in, the, well, the Rocky Mountains, and hence the athletic conference in name. We've got a uh, former Division II quarterback making his NFL preseason debut that I want to chat about a little bit later in the episode. And then finally, a wild way to cool off at fall camp. I would pay somebody money if they predict what I'm going to talk about later in the episode when it comes to cooling off at fall camp. It ain't some snow cone truck coming around to the practice field, I'll tell you that much. But as always, you can watch this episode on YouTube if you are. Hello there. Don't forget uh, the timestamps, video chapters, bottom of the screen. Fast forward to any part of the conversation you think sounds interesting. Listen pretty much anywhere, though. Follow us on the socials. Let's get into the guest conversation. Get this episode rocking and rolling. Join the show tonight. Man's coming in to coach the outside linebackers of at Norwich University in Vermont. Uh, aside from that, also the recruiting coordinator for the cadets, PJ Curie. What's going on, man? What's up, man? Thanks for having me. Super excited. And uh, hopefully I can get there in person one day. So that would be that'd be yeah. pretty special. Um, you've got a pretty cool location, at least geographically up there. Um, you were talking about it before we got going here. From Staten Island, now you're up in Vermont. Like that is just a that's a hike. Yeah, it's probably five and a half hour drive to where my mom lives or where I grew up. And okay. the, only, the only thing I really miss is New York is probably the pizza and my mom's Italian food, but I can survive with the rest of it up here. Everything else, though. Yeah. Yeah, you got it pretty good up there. Yeah, location-wise, yeah. is definitely uh, pretty sweet. I know I had to do uh, my research on you guys just because I'm still learning, like, admittedly. Like every single episode we have, I still learn about a, a new spot and a new, you know, group of faces and new people. And that's what's fun about this. But the oldest private military college in the United States, the birthplace of ROTC, and perhaps the coolest part of all of it, you guys have a tank at your stadium? Yeah, right. I'm probably saying it right now, right in the back of the end zone is Sabine Sally. It's a World War II tank that was refurbished, doesn't run anymore. There's all like different myths and stuff Damn. of of Norwich University, but it does not run. It's a really cool, you know, there's a bunch of pictures, you know, if, if everyone wants to look them up, but really, really cool location right in the mountains, you know, the Green Mountains in Vermont. Yeah, we have a tank right in the back of our end zone, which is awesome. So I know that field has undergone renovations, at least in semi-recent history, obviously, but would the next potential booster uh, project, if you will, would be to get, uh, you know, maybe some renovations to the inside of that tank so we can have it parading around the track on Saturdays? Yeah, that's, a, that's above my pay grade. We do have, I think it's at least one flyover every, you know. Seriously? Every, yeah, one one flyover a year. Hopefully trying to push it for more. But, yeah, we have six home games going into this season. So everyone's kind of circling when the flyover is going to be. But, yeah, that's above my pay grade for that is uh, that's incredible, but understandable, obviously. You, you yeah. just get in there, you can't start making demands like that. Uh, yeah, right no, off the rip. <laughs> no. Certainly not, but when it comes to the the stadium itself, man, the and I had talked about it earlier, like the backdrop is just beautiful. You guys are kind of nestled into looks like you got a decent amount of elevation there, some great uh, probably some great fall colors and things. The stadium itself, again for this level of football, uh, maybe not so much on the away stand side, um, mm -hmm. but that home side, man. There's there's some really nice things going on in that stadium. Are you kind of surprised by the uh, the upgraded, uh, I guess, nature of the spot? Uh, yes and no. I think even before I got to Norwich, I've always kind of heard of them. I've known some people that went to Norwich. And then actually when I was at, I did a, a year at a prep school in Maine called Bridgen Academy. Okay. And we played a JV schedule but and we played Norwich University back in like 2015. So I've seen it before. I've heard, you know, before, the, you know, they've done some renovations to the press box or the turf field, but I've always kind of knew that they've had a really, really crazy atmosphere it's almost like going to an army navy game with you know with our core of cadet members being there and stuff like that but yeah really really excited you know september 7th is a home opener against our in-state rival we play for you know a rivalry trophy called the maple sap bucket oh yeah we'll get there don't worry yeah we, yeah we've had it for i think almost over five years and 
I think for that to be the first game, you know, our, our new head coach, Bill Russell, his first game as a head coach, he's been here for like 15 plus years. So I know everyone's it's, I'm getting juiced up just thinking about it. So we're super excited about that. Dude, that is, that is awesome. And you had, uh, and trust me, we'll get to that trophy because we had to talk about it. Yeah. That thing is <laughs> hilarious and awesome. I think equal parts, hilarious and awesome from my perspective as an outsider. Um, but you talked about Army and Navy, which um, I know people have talked about them because they're not getting their dedicated weekend this fall, correct? They're, have to, they're having to share that weekend now with some other college football games. Just kind of a, uh, people are not too happy about that one. But unlike Army and Navy, the students at Norwich, they don't necessarily have to enlist or serve after graduation, correct? Like you're not signing up for that as soon as you, you know, head to like that academy? Yeah, so it's, it's actually almost kind of three parts. So you can get here and do everyone does the Corps of Cadets if you decide to do, you know, the military, the ROTC lifestyle, and then you can graduate, do your four years of a military service. I mean, of your four years of, you know, the military lifestyle and commission to one of the branches. Gotcha. Or you can do the Corps of Cadets for four years and not have any military obligation at all after you graduate. So it's actually kind of interesting when you talk to a player and, and it's one of them is one of our captains, you know, he's going to do four years. This will be his fourth year in the Corps of Cadets. And after he graduates, he has no military obligation. And then we have one of our captains who, after he graduates, will have a, a, an unbelievable career in the military. And, and people ask, why do kids do that? Well, some of them, you know, A, from almost a young age, because they might have family members that did serve, they want to do the military, you know, for, for a career and, and come to Norwich. And some of them, you know, we have, you know, our top, probably our top two majors are cybersecurity and criminal justice. Well, if you do the Corps of Cadets for four years and you don't want to have a military obligation. That looks really, really good in your resume. Yeah. You know, go, going to go join the police force or something like that. And then the other part is the, which we call a civilian lifestyle, where you just go to school for four years and just be a regular, you know, college student, play football. Yeah. Except, you know, the only time you'll, you'll interact with any of our core members will be at football practice. You have no, you have zero obligation, you know, with the ROTC and the Corps of Cadets. That is very unique. Mm -hmm. it's one of a kind it's pretty it's pretty pretty awesome like i told you before i think i learned something new every day about the history of this school the different you know you kind of try and figure out what is what is a myth and and what is actually true and you know what's fiction and non-fiction yep there's just so many stories of you know the school's been around since 1819 that you can see you know right <laughs> on right on you know my my quarters up so it's it's pretty pretty cool yeah that's a good thing it's a good reminder Right. Um, and that's, I mean, you have to probably tackle that very often now though, being in, in your shoes of literally addressing all those things that you just talked about and talked about very well, by the way, very well yeah, articulated yeah. that, that came out. I know you're still trying to probably get the pitch down over there with the cadets, but, um, that came out smooth and, uh, probably something you're going to have to regurgitate and do a lot more often with a lot of recruits that maybe are not so familiar with the school, the tradition, the history, and those unique kind of different programs, uh, so to speak within that, because I'm sure. Yeah, I, I, I think sometimes, you know, like I, we were talking recruiting earlier today and a kid says, do I need to do the military? And we, and it's, it's you don't have to. So not that that's, that's a negative that we get. It's just a question we're always going to get. So I think, you know, kids are always going to ask that and kids are always going to ask it enthusiastically if you say yes. And, you know, I think there's kids that, that want the military. I think a lot more than you think, you know, I, I go on some of these yep. recruiting websites and I do it by whatever state I have. And let's say it's almost four states or three states. And there might be, you know, just on that recruiting service, there might be over 50 kids that actually want to do the military. So it's, yeah. it's more than you think of college or, or, you know, high school athletes who want to play college football that want to do the military, except we just offer a one of a kind opportunity where with some of our majors, you don't have to do the military at all. And that's what's what's sweet about it too is like unlike uh, you know army navy those kind of academies like you still get those guys that are incredibly enthusiastic about that and want to go pursue that but then you also have opportunities for the guys who maybe aren't in that boat right so you get um, mm -hmm. in that sense it's not like you're pinholed into a certain kind of kid but like you said it's not like you know there's not trying to stop it's not pulling teeth trying to go find kids that are interested in, in serving right but uh it's nice that you have both both sides there now they yeah, do yeah take... it's, it's, it's oh sorry yeah it's it's really cool that um like a kid can graduate here when he if he decides to commission one of the branches yeah he actually graduates the same rank as if someone went to you know the naval academy or army west point so when That's you actually dope. get yeah. to the nitty and gritty of things where they may be a kid who really really wants to go to west point but he might not get into West Point. That's really competitive yeah. to get into West Point. But when you start talking about, well, if you come to Norwich and you do the things you need to do, you end up getting the same opportunity as a graduate would from the Naval Academy 
or Army West Point. Yeah, so that's a selling awesome. piece, right? That's big time. That is. Yeah. I did not know that. And now they take. Um, it sounded like, at least from my research, like an ROTC class every semester. Is that is that accurate? Yeah, they do some, you know, like PT training and, okay. and regimental training that they have to do. You know, I can't wait. You know, I think they sometimes they have to wake up at like seven in the morning. Oh, yeah. Stuff like that. But the the really awesome thing is there's really never any scheduling conflicts. I think they do a great job That's of, good. you know, the ROTC and the, and the core do a great job of of kind of being, you know, one on one with or even being, you know, 100 percent with athletics. So a lot of them are Norwich alums. Our president who got here, I think, in May is a Norwich alum. And our athletic director, who is unbelievable, they do a great job of keeping a great relationship where we have a football player who will be at everything he has to do for the core and he'll be at everything he has to do for football. So yep. it's you know, in, all, in all the other sports, too. So look, I think this this is probably one of the I think it's like my fourth football job, third one at a, the college level. And it's it's probably where it's the most support I've ever seen from a university and athletic department, not just, you know, your athletic director, but all the other coaches want everyone else to win so it's it's really cool that's what you want but uh yeah much easier said than done at a lot of different places so glad to hear that is uh that's over there and that's uh very much the real deal and i know up here at northern they got rotc up here and, and we'd have spring practice sometimes would start at six or six thirty in the mornings which is ridiculous in, in its own right that's way too early to be hitting another grown individual with full pads on astroturf but um i say that not to you know begrudge the time but because those guys in the rotc had been in there by the time we we're even rolling up to the dome they were in there like they're finishing up their workout by the time we're rolling out onto the field and i'm sitting there looking at them i'm like damn i'm like you got this man it's something different and i respect i respect the hell out of it is awesome i know uh, rotc catches a lot of uh which is a lot of shit. I mean, if I'm being honest, when you compare it, I think from an outsider's perspective to some of the other uh, branches of those deals, but still a lot of commitment that goes into that, man. And uh, you think, because I also, you know, doing more reading, still have to follow some of those military rules when it comes to like things like hairstyles and kind of uh, presentation and appearance. Do you think you'll ever uh, lose a recruit due to uh, having to get a haircut? I don't know. I think, you know, we, we kind of, if you want to do the ROTC or the Corps of Cadets, I feel like you definitely know what you're getting yourself into. Yep. I think, you know, when the kids first get here, you know, they call them rooks and we have it scheduled where like, that's the rook day for them to get their haircut. So they buzz their heads. <laughs> they can't have facial hair anymore. So like, that's, you know, what they get here a little bit early to do football and the first year, you know, core for cadet, cadet members have to do, you know, that, that first semester training and kind of go through it. And, and you still get a mustache but, though, right? Yeah. I think some of our guys do. So, yeah. yeah. But like, you know, someone always asks is like, is it, is it hard to do the core and play football? And you have to say yes, but then you look at guys, you know, guys who are our captains of the team, guys who are all conference player for this team. You know, one of one of our all conference linebackers, who's really really good. He also wrestles, and he's in the yeah. Corps of Cadets, and he's going to be, and he's in an unbelievable military career. So you take a guy like that, you take a guy who's on our staff, our receiver coach Trevor Chase, who played football here for five years, and we had the COVID year. He did the Corps of Cadets, but didn't, you know commission after he like again he wanted to just do the core of cadets yep. but no military obligation at all and he was a you know i think he's the most decorated offensive player in norwich history and he was three-time you know captain you know conference player of the year and so you you kind of use guys like that as an example of guys who've not only done it but have done it at a high level and then you take guys like one of our other captains just a, a civilian student i've actually he was actually the starting quarterback when me and Coach Johnson were at the University of New England. He's our starting safety. I believe he was in all conference last year. He'll be he's an engineering major. He's just a civilian student. Hell so yeah. it's it's cool That's to kind so of have neat, that connection man. with him. Yeah. No, the more I learn about it, it it's like it's actually like very intriguing and you can see why it's uh, appealing to a lot of guys, right? hundred yeah. percent. Um and we can we can circle back now to something you had started talking about earlier and talking about that that trophy. But opening the season this year, again, had to do my research because Castleton, not a name that I am very familiar with being from kind of this part of the States and just not, um, you know, delving into that region as much as I have. But what I've come to find out is, is maybe I should know more about uh, not only this region, but this rivalry, man, the sap bucket. The thing is, is just incredible. The namesake is incredible. It looks like someone potentially threw it together in their garage during the tailgate and then brought it out afterwards. I think it makes it equal parts uh, endearing and hilarious First reactions when you saw the uh, the sap bucket trophy because that thing is sick. Yeah, it's it's pretty pretty cool. I mean, we we've had it since I think the last five years, 
There's yeah. actually another trophy that we have, I think over like 20 plus years against Middlebury College okay. in Vermont. They're like in the NESCAC, the New England Small College Athletic Conference. They they call them a, the small Ivy Leagues because they're high academic schools, but they don't play non-conference anymore. So we, we've te technically have had that trophy for the last like maybe 15 plus years. But yeah, the Maple Sap Bucket is really, really awesome. I think to, to be a part of any trophy game, I think is awesome. I, we play three a year, and it's it's going to be my second game I've coached in at in all of college football. Last yeah. year when I was at the University of New England, we played Husson for the Lobster Trap Trophy. That's another trophy if you want to oh, that's sweet. Take a look at. Yeah, that's awesome. That was a really, really awesome rivalry. And, yeah, and this one's in-state too. Like when I was at uni with Husson, there's there's hatred, you know, on, on our side with them. It's your, it's your in-state rival. You know, they, they have a new head coach, got promoted from within – we have a new head coach got promoted from within, you know, a little bit earlier than, than he did. So, we, but yeah, I think it's, it's circle, you know, I think, you know, like anything, it's, it's basically our, you know, Ohio state, Michigan, except we get to play week one. So if it's at a conference. Yeah. I think, yeah. Like I told you before, like I'm getting, you know, I'm shaking about it, you know, just thinking about it in a good way. So that's, that's what's so wild too, that week one that like, we'll definitely talk about that, but like the trophy itself, man, you have like the literal, like, that bucket has seen some things uh, and it's seen yeah. a lot of good football, <laughs> you know, among other things. Um, and then you just got it attached to this stump and it is just like one of the most, it's got some of the most character, I think in, in all of college football. But like you said, the fact that this game is not happening in like week seven, it's happening in week one to me is just kind of crazy. But uh, at the same time, like that's awesome. Like the fact that you get a yeah. game right out of the gate that is, uh, you know, there's there's no such thing as a warm up game or these some of these FBS teams will schedule like the cupcake games. You'll go down to play a smaller squad, whatever. But like, you guys potentially have the opposite of that. And yes, you've won as for you as in Norwich have won this the last five or so years. But this is a game that, like, right away that uh, you know you never have to get your guys excited to play week one. Like that's something that's just a given. I think that's probably tenfold probably for this week one game. Talk about the anticipation for that one right out of the gate. Yeah, I think so. If you take it as like a, like a bigger picture, our men's and women's hockey team are really, really good. Um, they played Castleton. And if that was a, a huge game, you know, when okay. our women's and men's both played Castleton, our guys were there. Our guys wanted to bring the sap bucket out. So that kind of shows like that's sweet. You know, how much that means. And, I don't, I haven't touched it yet. I don't. I think on accident I kind of stayed away from it <laughs> until we probably until we officially kind of win it again. I like I that. Really, I haven't really touched it or looked at it. And then, yeah, I'm mean, even just like moving forward. You know, week two, I think it's the second Friday night game in Norwich history against St. Lawrence, a school in the Liberty League in New York. Yep. We play for the Hoffman Cup. They they have it. And then later on in the year, we play the United States Coast Guard Academy, and we play for the Mug, and that's. They call it the little army navy game. That goes back, I think, to over, you know, fifty yep. to maybe a hundred years ago. But yeah, first game, I think it's wild just to open it up. I don't if you look at our schedule, the conference we're in and even our out of conference game, it's it's not, you know, I kind of think it's like the black and blue, you know, the the black and blue league of, of division three in New England. You know, the teams that we play, you know, in conference and out of conference, those are those are some tough teams uh and it open it up against Castleton is is really really awesome, especially you know, it's a different culture, it's a different vibe to what other teams are used to from Norwich University. So just to get that you know first first game for you know Coach Bill Russell as the head coach, and even for you know the, if I have to talk about them for you know for Castleton and them, they have a new head coach. He's been on staff. He he attended Castleton, so if you don't think that they're going to be ready to go, you yeah, know, we're wrong. So. That's neat, man. That is pretty sweet. Um, and you would, I was that kind of led me into my next question of like some of those other rivalry games for you guys. And I was definitely aware of the Coast Guard one because that's one that yeah. that obviously stands out, especially given just the nature of those two institutions. Like that seems like such an obvious, uh, great rivalry and good competition there. The Little Army Navy game is that's got just a sweet, sweet kind of ring to it because it's the same, that same intensity, the same kind of background and and that kind of uh, ideals uh, in a sense, just on maybe a little bit of a, a smaller scale when it comes to the national stage. So I love, I love that. Um, in St. Lawrence, that was the other one for you guys. That's definitely a, yeah, a when we'll, it comes to rivalries. We'll, yeah, we'll play them week two. They're, they're in the Liberty League. So yep. they're in like upstate New York as, you know, they're probably five hours from where I'm from in New York. Yeah. So that feels like different. It's a different world out there. They're, they're oh, yeah. really, really, really good. I believe academic school, and it's just another rivalry game. And then it's Friday night, so that that's the thing. Like week one is Castleton Trophy game, in state rival. You go week two Trophy game 
another rivalry Friday night. Damn. And then and then you go to homecoming against Huston. So I think, you know, a parent and a, a prospective student athlete access that are one of our visits, you know, over the summer. What game do you guys recommend us coming? There's six of them. We were like, <laughs> they're all awesome. Like we, we we can't tell you which one not to and and to come to, but like homecoming, you know, Coast Guard. Then you have, you know, like family and parents weekend. And then, you you know, we play for, you know, three trophy games plus, you know, the conference trophy, right? So you can end up playing for, if it's a good year, you can get four trophies in your, under, under your belt. So we're just, I'm just excited to, to get going. And it's really just kind of focus on Castleton and stuff like that. Yeah, that's the correct answer, right? Definitely the yeah. correct answer. Your week one, got to, got to get that in there at the end. I respect it. Um, but, you know, going with that same idea of like, you have a chance to play for all these trophies. Hey, in a good year, you could be, you, you might need to upgrade your hardware shelf over there in the uh, coach's office, the football building, whatever, whatever you got going on over there. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts over there when it comes to hardware. Yeah, not, yeah, unfortunately, not recently. You know, we're, you know, definitely, you know, there's a reason why there's, there's a new head coach. And yep. Oh, yeah. He's mowed from within, but, but like I said, Coach Bill Russell, he's awesome. He's been here when they won championships. And yep. I think that's, it's kind of bringing it back, you know, restoring their tradition and making it better. And the kids know when they walk through the hallways of, you know, we have a, an unbelievable hallway that in areas that got rebranded with, and they see that the history of not only just Norwich football, but athletics. But yeah, when you walk by you know, our offices down on the second floor, where a bunch of the assistant coaches are, you'll see the pictures of the all Americans, the yearly awards that guys have, you know, the all D3 football.com guys, the, the conference champions and the, and the bowl wins. And he, and he's lived it. You know, he has the rings when they won conference games and, and bowl games and stuff like that. And and fortunately for some of us, we know some alum that went here and and hearing it from them. That's probably the, I think the most important thing that, or one of the the coolest things that, you know, since I got to Norwich, how many people have I've known my entire life said, Oh, you know, I know someone who went to Norwich or my cousin's brother went to Norwich or, or my cousin's cousin went to Norwich or something like that. And I think one of our coaches were on the road, spring recruiting he's behind a car with with a norwich sticker i'm at i'm at a restaurant i start talking to this random dude and he says oh my brother actually went to norwich and it just it just you know we kind of say norwich is everywhere it's it's really everywhere and it's not just in new england you know i'm sure you know like you said you're, you're from michigan correct yep. that's where you're so we probably have a lot of alum in michigan you know we're, we're a nationally known brand the logo kind of it goes for itself and it, and it speaks for itself of, of who we are. And I think that's probably like, you kind of feel the pressure of it. It's kind of as close as you could be of coaching at a big time school with yeah. you know the pressure of the alum. And cause they want, they want to see this school do good, not only as a university, but as a football team, they want that, you know, they want the school to, to get back to winning games again. And, yeah. Uh, that's what happens when you have a, a program with a lot of great history and tradition. The The mm -hmm. good thing is that you have the history and the tradition and that, uh, you know, I'm not going to say the bad thing, but the other side of that is there are expectations to get back to the history and the tradition and, and yeah. those winning ways. And uh, sometimes those people on the other end are maybe don't have, I don't have their patient pants on when it comes to uh, how we're going to get there and how we're going to make those things happen. But that's a good problem to have a very good problem to have to be in a, to be in a program like that. Um, speaking of branding, is that a, that a Norwich hat with the state outline or is that like a, is that a separate deal? Yeah. Yeah. We got them. So it's a state outline here. We got the American flag. Oh, that's sick. And it's a camel on the back and on the back has our logo. We kind of, our whole athletic department went to New Balance. Okay. Which is, so we have, yeah, you know, I see you repping. I see you repping there, yep. Yeah, the hot jacket is pretty cool. Uh, New Balance is actually kind of cool with, with a lot of their gear, and I think it's, it's a big New England brand, right? Boston College Yep. is New Balance for everything besides football. Uh, I know the University of Maine and Bryant University in Rhode Island, a couple, those couple two one double A schools, they they just got the New Balance. U-Man has been New Balance for a while, and then – I forgot what NFL player is doing New Balance now, so it's kind of once again, right? Norwich University does th things differently. We're new; we just got the New Balance for football, and that's hopefully, true. that's an up and coming brand. You know, hopefully, we're we're the faces of it in New England. Yeah, that'd be cool. That would definitely be sweet. But uh, to, to finish off, I guess from my piece here before Norwich, assistant at Wagner, we talked about uh, Chris Callieri, who was on the show, and just incredible human, incredible football player, but. You know, obviously, besides that connection, what big takeaways did you have from being at that at the D1 level as an assistant? And uh, how does that translate over to what you have going on right now at the end of the day? I mean, ball is ball. But being at that level, seeing how they operate, what do you bring from that experience, uh, you know, over to Vermont? 
Yeah, I, I loved my time when I was at Wagner College. I GA'd there and then stayed on an extra year. Um, I still annoy those guys. Yeah. I text those guys every day, especially he's the DC and the D-line coach. We didn't coach a season with each other, but I probably call and text him every day about something. Run fits or this question. And he, he probably is, I think he probably has me blocked because, you know, they're <laughs> in season right now. But, yeah, we did not, you know, I was part of, you know, they had a lot of turnover because that's what kind of school it is. It's a it's an awesome GA t- type of opportunity to get yep. your match and stuff. But we did not win a lot of games when I was there, but we had a lot of fun. So you talk about, you know, I coach under Thomas Selle. He has probably as much of an influence on my career as someone could, you know, could do. I, I think I was with him. I always joke around that I was his GA because yep. I was with him with every position group we had. And then I worked with some unbelievable coaches, maybe some guys I've not heard of, like Jim Munson, who's a legendary high school football coach in New York City. He was our special teams guy. So I got to learn kind of the grind of special teams and why people kind of are going crazy and pulling their hair out and coach some really good guys like Daryl Wilson, who's a DC now at at Dell State. Chris Newguy was our OC. Every GA I worked with was we did the GA grind. So I still talk to those guys and and bother them and call them all the time. But yeah, it was really, really awesome. I got, you know, to get the experience as a GA and kind of right away, you kind of get a punch in the face of what college football is. It's not, you know, you're not winning championships every year. We went 0-11, 1-10, they went 4-7, and and they're really turning it around, hopefully winning, you know, the the NEC, the 1AA conference they're in. But just just recruiting in general, I learned a lot. I think the one thing Thomasella told me early on, and I'm 27, I think I started working when I was 23, 24, he said, you're going to get a job because you're a good recruiter and then the football will come. So I think it was pretty easy for us to to learn how to recruit as young coaches because we had COVID, right? So I was, I think I was telling someone today, I would have my New York areas from, you know, we would meet as a staff, maybe nine to three, four to six, I was doing New York. And then he told me, take the whole West Coast. So I was probably doing from eight to almost 11, 1130, calling kids on the West Coast. Yeah. So just kind of really recruiting, you know, kids is is what I learned the most. And then the one thing I'm not happy about is – happy that I'm out of it is is the portal. I think the portal is awesome. Oh, my goodness, yeah. The portal is awesome. But when, you know, we always joked around that we kind of rotated. You went on the road for a week or two, you came back in, and you were in the transfer portal. So I kind of call it like, you know, you were in the abyss of recruiting. You're talking to a high school kid you offer a scholarship to. And then you're figuring out the logistics of of getting a ju- a junior college kid from California yeah. to St. Island, New York. So it it was it was pretty pretty interesting. But yeah, learned a lot from those guys. I love those guys to death. You know, especially the guys that didn't name drop. They're all awesome. I think, you know, the influence that you know Thomas Sella and Jim Munson have had on my career. I can it can be a whole podcast just talking about some of those guys. So that's awesome, man. No, that's great. And the the portal definitely is a, is a big one, but. Uh... Again, if you can if you can sell, I mean, can sell is maybe not the right word, but you know how I'm using it. If you can sell a place, yeah. you can sell, uh, you know, a, a kind of a mission and a mission statement of that sense, and you can get kids to commit to something, you know, bigger than themselves. There's there's gonna be spots for you anywhere. You can get people to buy into something bigger than themselves, whether it's football or, or life in general. But uh, that's all I got for you, Coach PJ. I appreciate your time, man. It's been a blast. Yeah, appreciate you guys having me. Of course, man. Well, you have a good night. Definitely looking forward to uh, seeing the tank doesn't fire when you guys score touchdowns or anything. We do have a cannon. I think okay. it goes off right before kickoff. So okay. Well, I'm hoping yeah, to hear got- some some cannon sh- cannon fire this uh, this fall, man. Yeah, we got to get you out for a game. That'd be awesome. That would be sweet. That would be very cool. I appreciate you, Coach. Have a good rest of your night, hey, man. man. Thanks for having me. Thank you to Coach PJ for joining the podcast tonight. Let's talk about the RMAC, the Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference. For those of you not familiar, get with it. A lot of good football in this conference, the most notable being Colorado School of Mines, who's made back-to-back runs at the national championship game. Uh, the Ordiggers over there, big time. you got some big-time schools like Western Colorado, CSU Pueblo, that are looking to make some noise this year or long. You got on the list in that conference, but those two definitely come to mind right away. They made some uh, kind of some big news, I guess big Maybe that might be the right word for it, but interesting news. You know, definitely that at their kind of media day, if you will, this past week. And, uh, you know, the first minute of this video I'm about to show here, week zero is what they talk about. It's, you know, that being endorsed everywhere in D2, which, of course, this is the first year that uh, D Division Two football will have week zero across the board. Not just the RMAC, though. So I fast forwarded to the part that makes the RMAC a little bit different. And uh, before I talk about it, I guess I'll have... Uh, the people associated with the conference itself go ahead and uh, tell you what's going on. 
but beginning in 2026, the RMAC uh, Athletic Directors President's Council have approved a standard buy in week six, beginning in 2026, in week six, where all teams will have a buy. This is placed strategically into the middle of the season in order to give our student athletes a break. If you're Colorado School of Mines the last two years making runs to the national championships, you're playing up to 15, 16 weeks straight. That's a tough run for our student athletes in a very challenging and difficult sport physically. So we have strategically placed this bye week and it will also require our student athletes to have at least three days in that week off from their countable athletically related activity. This was proposed by our student athlete health and safety committee. It was supported by all of our athletic trainers, our administrators, and our president's council. So we're excited to announce that opportunity in 2026. All right, you get the gist right there, right? So starting in 2026, um, he, he, the first part of the video that I kind of skipped forward was him talking about week zero and how uh, teams are more than welcome to utilize week zero and utilize a buy, whatever. But And that goes into 2025. It's going to be the same thing as next year. But as soon as 2026 hits, you're getting a bye week in week six, whether you like it or hate it or, or otherwise. And I have mixed feelings on this. The obvious one, though, is what he just talked about, right? If you are a team that is going to the national championship, uh, you know, going to that game like Colorado School of Mines has done the last two years, you're playing 15 weeks. Like, there's so much physicality that goes into the sport that playing for that long is just absurd. And that's the people have talked about too uh, at the division one playoff, right? When you expand this bracket, you're playing more and more and more football just to get to the national championship. There's good and bad that comes with both sides of that argument, but that is what's going on there. It's 2026. Every team in the conference has a mandated bye week during week six of their season. So week six of the season in 2026 and moving forward, there will not be any RMAC football. There'll be no teams from that conference playing games. And so it feels really odd. And the next part of that is he talks about three days off from football activities or athletic countable related activities. I think it was the verbiage kind of, you know, that he used in that sentence uh, for the athletes during that week. So they need three days of nothing. That, that was my, I guess, my first big question. What are these athletic, I use air quotes here. If you're listening, I'm using air quotes. What are these quote unquote athletic or football activities? Obviously practice, right? That means three days without practice. But is that three days without lifts, without walkthroughs, meetings, film study? Like, what exactly does that mean? And I'm sure somewhere they've got to be at least meeting about that, or maybe they've already decided and I haven't seen that, and that's on me. If that's the case, I'll come right out and say that. But I think there definitely needs to be some more specificity there because, uh, you know, say it's not practice. I, I know a lot of coaching staffs that will keep them boys in the meeting room all day and, and make sure you, you study film for that uh, next opponent, whoever that, uh, that may be. But the obvious one, though, I, I like the idea of having it during week six. It's a great time for the kids to get a break, you know, halfway through the year, uh, especially if you're a team that plans on going to make a run in the playoffs, which, you know, hopefully all of them are, right? Um, but, you know, kind of on the other side, though, why mandate it? It, it feels odd, you know, to decide for coaches when their buy is because as a head coach of a football program at this level, like you really are in charge of a lot of what goes on scheduling wise and making those connections and trying to get those deals done. And so when you mandate, you know, this specific date, the specific block of your schedule for the year, and now you're told that you have to have a buy here, you cannot have any leniency or flexibility that might even make scheduling harder knowing you can't use that date. If that makes any sense. Right. To me, it kind of feels a little bit odd in that regard. But again, I think that the payoffs are probably a little bit more important than that. And I am I, I definitely am, am backing this in the sense that it makes a lot of sense um, to have that a bye week in some way mandated, because there are a lot of teams that won't utilize a bye week that'll just, you know, go right through it. And that, you know, that that could be pretty detrimental for uh, for the student athletes. But there was more news from the RMAC, talking about some of the other additions uh, or changes, I guess, rather, they'll be making when it comes to uh, football this year, in 2024, this fall. And uh, the RMAC Director of Football Officials, Tandy Campbell, he announced some rule changes in place for the upcoming season. A couple of them here, I'll just go through and list them. The first one's pretty interesting. Five tablets on each sideline assisting coaches in determining whether to challenge a call. And so obviously at the conference level, if you make a rule like this where uh, instant replay is a great example where the MIAA, the Gulf South, I believe the RMAC and the GLIAC have all implemented instant replay. 
Um, obviously, they have because we got the tablets coming in now. But that was something that if you're going to mandate that at a conference level, you have to make sure those facilities, that equipment, all like everything that is required to run that is available at all your member schools inside of that conference. So uh, you might think that's not that big of a deal, but five tablets on each sideline for a D2 squad that you can go and, and use to assist in challenging a call. You know, for a coach to come to the sideline and see a replay of something on a tablet and say, hey, that ain't worth it. I'm keeping the red, you know, challenge flag in my pocket. That's pretty sweet. Another one, you've got uh, the two-minute timeout, not the two-minute warning, even though it is literally apparently just implementing the NFL's two-minute warning at the end of the uh, second and fourth quarters. So another little break there that will break up the timing of games a little bit. We'll see how that affects different offenses, and that's more of a game-planning thing. Like You obviously game-plan different drives or plays or series around uh, when you know you have breaks in the time, especially when you're trying to make late drives in the half. But uh, some other ones, I think these are more minor changes. Uh, horse collar tackle is now illegal everywhere in the field, including inside of the box. That's something that, you know, kind of varies, but definitely something that they will uh, be taking in, keeping a closer eye on. And then halftime doesn't start until the referee announces that halftime is starting. I, apparently that's worthy enough. But um, really, though, it's just the five tablets on each sideline. I think that is really cool. The fact that they can uh, start to really get into that and embrace that side of football, I think is really neat, especially the Division two level. We just don't see enough of that. I think it's just a cool added element to small school football. But enough of that. Enough talking about the RMAC. We'll stay on the D2 side, though. Let's talk about a former Division II quarterback making his NFL preseason debut with the Chicago Bears. And there he is. The man formerly an Argonaut at the University of West Florida. How about Austin Reed? And you guys might not know him from West Florida. Those of you listening, I mean, a lot of you probably do because, let's face it, if you're this far into the video, you're a fan of D2 football. Uh, but a lot of you would know him from Western Kentucky, and we'll talk about that a little bit here. But he did make his debut with the uh, Chicago Bears in the NFL preseason. The game, well, that was one against the Tex Texans, I believe, and it was the one that got postponed just uh, due to weather and things. But before we talk about, you know, he didn't do anything too crazy in the game. I believe he only had, like, two or three um, – completions for like maybe 10, 15 yards or so. But the fact that he was out there getting reps is definitely really neat. Now, when you look at the Bears, we all know who's uh, slated to be quarterback went, uh, quarterback one for them uh, heading into the year in Caleb Williams. And then we've got another Division II guy, a true, you know, through and through Division II product, and Tyson Bajant, who's currently QB2 right now for the Bears as far as I'm concerned. So shout out to Chicago for giving some of these uh, quote-unquote small school guys a shot. Tyson Bajant played a good bit last year um, and, and became a really cool story that I know we've covered quite a bit. But Austin Reed is is very much a dude under center and a very dangerous one at that. This is a, uh, a photo of him from the preseason action just the other night under center for Chicago. There he is dropping back. And I wanted to just touch on this dude's stats in the time that he was at West Florida. I don't think you guys understand – this guy was absurd. He was the uh, national freshman of the year, the uh, offensive freshman of the year in the conference. He threw for, in 2019, as a redshirt freshman, 4,090, basically 4,090 yards, oh, almost 300 a game, was 13th nationally. Uh, he was 13-1 and one as a starter after taking over the starting role after week one. He threw for 40 touchdowns, ran for six more, completed 57% of passes, and... Uh, just like some of these stats are are just ridiculous. Led the Gulf South in passing yards, touchdown passes, and uh, all these other statistical categories. He goes on to uh, Western Kentucky and just has a ridiculous career with, uh, that would be the Hilltoppers, I do believe, correct? Some of the coolest uh, helmets and potential mascot. Yeah, Hilltoppers in, uh, in college football. This dude was uh, in all-conference kind of uh, – honorable mention type guy, but we had uh, a lot of different accolades under his belt. Looking at the website here, there's so many different things that uh, he was a part of. And he started all 26 games he appeared in during his two years of a Western Kentucky and uh, threw for over 8,000 yards in two years and 71 touchdowns. So again, it's one thing to say the stats at the D2 level. It's another to go up to the D1 level like that and literally have the same level of production. He threw for 4,000 at D2. Guess what he did? Both years at uh, at Western Kentucky, threw for 4,000 yards. That is ridiculous. He uh, finished his career at Western Kentucky fourth in program history and pass attempts, third in completions, fourth in passing yards, and tied in at sixth for completion percentage. But he's also second in touchdown passes, 
third in yards and eighth in wins as a starting quarterback. For a guy that was only there for two years. That's absurd. So really excited for him. Wanted to make sure I touched on that because uh, we love anytime there's some small school or former small school guys getting a chance over at the pros. But I've got more of a fun story. Uh, a story, I guess, maybe is, is not the right word for it, but a fun little bit, a Twitter bit to uh, finish out tonight's episode on. We're going over to Rice University, and I talked about it earlier in the beginning of the episode. I said, there's a team that did something very funny and very cool, honestly, at fall camp and fall practice where it's getting pretty hot out and the guys are out there for quite a bit of time. And I said, you know what? This, this ain't your mom and pop's snow cone truck pulling up to practice afterwards. This is literally a freezer truck coming to fall camp. And I want you guys to just watch this and have the, I'm assuming the same reaction as I did to taking a look at this video. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Like, dude, like this just, this cracks me up. And like, I, I, for some reason, I think the thing that stands out to me right away is like, one, they're making this into a grand entrance. What is Buddy doing on the side? You're like, we need a hype crew getting out of the freezer truck. And then these guys are walking out like it's game day. Did we not see a single smile on any of these guys' faces when they're coming down the steps? You know how elated I would be if my coach brought a freezer truck to fall camp. I got to go chill in that son of a bitch for a little bit. Just give me like, you know, five, 10 minutes in there. I don't know what fall camp day one was like for the, I believe it's the owls over there at rice. Apparently it was grueling as hell because there is no joy or emotion on these guys faces coming out of this thing. I think that is hilarious, but this is the freezer truck they brought out uh, for the owls. I have a couple more pictures that we can uh, talk about here a little bit. Coaches and, and uh, you know different athletic departments continue to be creative in how they handle the heat and things of that nature. And I think this was also kind of like a partnership in, you know, you see the at there for the company. I think this is a lot of like branding for them. So it's almost like, is this a team NIL deal with this like freight company? Is that technically what's going on here? It certainly could be. Look at this thing. They got it parked right next to the field. And it's got to be like, you can see the front there. It looks like there's almost basically a big fat ass air conditioning unit on the front of that. Um, and I did my research, guys. Like the typical freezer trucks of this like freight variety, they can maintain temperatures as low as zero degrees Fahrenheit. Right? I mean, you're transporting frozen goods, but like zero degrees. That's as low as these guys can get. Now, is it zero degrees and those guys walked in there? No, it's not zero degrees. Uh, but th the fact that it can do that, and if they're coming out and you can see you can just see the cold, that air just oozing out of it. This is hilarious. This is really cool. We need to see more of this uh, potentially in college football. Um, but it just makes a lot of sense. Shit, if this is an NIL deal for the team, at least like a recognition, kind of a brand deal with this freight company, this transport company, that, you know, kudos to them. Kudos to them for setting this up. I think this is really sweet um, and just cool for the Rice Owls, man. How many guys get to say that they could step in a freezer truck when it got too hot at practice? Now, on the flip side of this, you already know Coach was saying, Ain't no way you're complaining about the heat right now. You just got to go stand in a freezer truck for 10 minutes. Now you're going to come out here and complain about the heat, right? I, I can guarantee, I can already see that exchange happening on the football field. Uh, but this is very cool. Nonetheless, had to finish out the episode on that one. So thank you very well. For, uh, thank you very much, all of you. English starts to get tough at the end of these episodes. And you've talked enough. Thank you for tuning in. This has been D1 Rejects. I'm Kobe Manzo.